Next, let's move on to the session for a special lecture presented by Dr. Kazuya Yoshida. Dr. Yoshida is a professor in the Department of Aerospace Engineering. The title of his lecture is Robotics for Space Missions, From the Earth to the Moon and Asteroids. I would like to inform you that Dr. Yoshida will take one or two questions right after his lecture. If you have questions about his lecture, please post them to the Q&A box. Dr. Yoshida, please. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And so uh, I'm Kazuya Yoshida, a professor in aerospace engineering department. So today um, I'm happy to speak about uh, robotics for space missions using this great opportunity. So yep, this first slide uh, introduces uh, our department of uh, aerospace engineering. And we have a large number of the professors and research laboratories doing uh, covering the uh, aeronautical engineering disciplines and as well as uh, astronautical engineering uh, disciplines. And among them, uh, I, my laboratory is dedicated for the space uh, exploration. So um, I am doing space robotics together with a very well motivated international students. And yeah, um, let me start uh, my talk by asking a question. Why do we go to outer space? So um, it's easy to answer that uh, I am interested in space, but actually uh, it's not that easy to explain the why we, mankind, should go to outer space. So I hope you find, you try to find your answer while listening my talk today. Um, by the way, so the question, the why we go to the moon, because it's not easy. So this was a very famous uh, speech made by US um, president uh, in 1960s. So then as a result of the, uh, this uh, very big challenge, so um, we humankind made a successful landing on the surface of the moon in the year of 1969. So, and the, um, yeah, by the, the such um, the big challenge and great endeavor. So now uh, we completed, conducted, um, yeah, uh, such a great goal uh, to visit the moon and uh, get some uh, soil samples and safely return to the back to the earth. But uh, from the engineering point of view, uh, there are a number of the milestones and uh, steps um, uh, to achieve uh, such a great goal. Um, yeah, starting with um, flyby mission, uh, the uh, hard running at the beginning, but mo the more challenge was needed to make a successful orbiting around the moon and finally the, the soft landing and, and then also the safe return to the earth. So then uh, um, I would say that not only by NASA United States, but um, the former Soviet Union, USSR at the time, um, the co both conducted uh, the great challenges and made uh, such a successful um, achievement on the uh, robotic lunar uh, unmanned exploration and yes, and material sample return, yes, and human expedition, yes. So um, in the following part, uh, I'd like to focus on the challenge to the moon from the robotics and engineering point of view. And then I would like to move on the topics on the asteroid. So um, back to this, uh, the very famous picture, great picture uh, achieved in the year of the 1969. So honestly, um, I was a small boy uh, at the time, and I was watching this uh, stuff um, uh, throughout the uh, TV broadcasting, and I was so excited, and I was um, um, motivated. Oh, okay, well, space, space is good. Space exploration is fantastic. So then uh, the, the, the road was uh, not uh, really straightforward, but I finally, yeah, um, a, a find a way 
to do the research on the space uh, development. Then I, I had the opportunity to join Tohoku University. Then I start up the research laboratory doing the, this type of the research on the robotics exploration of space. But this uh, the picture um, give a um, general idea the how the lunar surface look like. So yeah, surface is very quiet, quiet, no vacuum, and temperature is very severe. And then the surface is covered with a soft material called regolith, and the, the scenery look like a sand dune, and we see some scattered rocks. And so, but still, that this uh, this place is really mysterious, and we have we can find many reasons that I go, going back to the moon. But um, yeah, this is again the uh, the uh, one of the scene from the NASA's. Uh, uh, Apollo mission and Apollo 15, 16, 17 uh, had uh, such a, a great um, um, a challenge uh, driving the, a, a, such a, a, a electricity, uh, electrically uh, uh, driven vehicle. And, and then uh, you, uh, we got the idea then how the surface scenery looked like. And the, yeah, as I mentioned, that the surface is covered with soft, dusty, uh, uh, particle materials and then uh, wheels uh, uh, kicked up at these particles, but because of the no uh, air, so that these particles come down back, come down to the surface very quickly. And the uh, gravity is um, slightly small, uh, one sixth of the Earth's gravity, so that's why the vehicle looks so bumpy. And um, so, but, but this um, 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 image gave um, uh, quite a lot of information and the ideas on the surface of the moon. And also the, uh, um, a, a large amount of the rock and soil samples were brought back uh, during the Apollo mission. In total, 380 kilograms. So the, uh, that helps us to understand the, um, you know, um, the surface uh, material composition and formation history of the moon. Then uh, this video, is um, 1972 uh, from Apollo 17, the final mission of the Apollo program. And so that uh, after this, no humans have visited the moon. Um, so um, many people are today discussing, okay, we should go back to the moon. We should go back to the moon. But um, meanwhile, there are a number of unmanned orbital missions missions to visit the moon and get more and more um, exciting information from the moon. So the, this picture was taken by Japanese mission uh, orbiter uh, named Kaguya. So uh, that year was a 2007 and um, 07. And the, as you see, that very beautiful Earth in the center uh, over the surface of the moon. So this is a very beautiful, fantastic uh, Earth lights on the moon for general public. But scientifically, that this picture has um, another meaning. So this region um, in the center of the um, image, that is a South Pole, over the South Pole. Then a South Pole of the moon, also the North Pole as well, um, is a, such a, a place. Uh, the yeah, sunlight comes from only the almost the horizons. So then uh, the, yeah, there are some um, uh, hills and craters. And in the bottom of the crater in North Pole, South Pole region, so there's no chance to get sunlight. So this means that the temperature is very, very low. So then uh, we call such a region as cold trap. Then if there are some uh, volatile materials, such as water, uh, water, uh, water may exist in the form of ice because of the very, very low temperature. And even that, that environment is a vacuum, but no chance to evaporate, then it stays there. So then uh, we can expect the, uh, such, uh, the water ice repository uh, in such a permanent shadowed regions. 
So, and this brings us the, that a great idea uh, that uh, uh, to go there and uh, try to make a, um, an exploration and uh, find the evidence of the water ice. So, um, yeah, such a plan is, is now discussed, but uh, so far, the orbital missions were uh, achieved, and uh, from the orbit, the remote sensing aspect, the, uh, the, there are a strong signature of the, the hydrogen uh, or oxygen or H2O in particular. Um, so, and this is another, this another picture from NASA tells that these blue spots uh, shows um, uh, that exist possible existence of the water that corresponds to the uh, shadowed region uh, on the surface of the moon. So why the water is so important in our life? And as when we plan that a human outpost on, on the surface of the moon, uh, water is first of all essential. And from the water, we can get the hydrogen and the oxygen. And oxygen is also is essential for the uh, life support. And hydrogen, hydrogen is very useful for rocket fuel. So um, today that the, uh, we use uh, um, hydrogen oxygen uh, for the um, yeah, rocket, uh, rocket engines. So yeah, that's why in this sense that the water ice is, is very um, important pressures as a natural. So then the question is uh, how to find the water and how to extract. And so there are a number of the ideas, but uh, we should conduct these missions, this type kind, kind of things by uh, robotics. So then I, in, and I would like to uh, show a short video clip uh, to explain that this, uh, this idea. It only takes about four days to reach the moon. It offers a convenient option for high-frequency access, easy communications, and its gravity allows for the use of terrestrial technology. The lander will touch down on the moon's surface and dispatch small networked rovers. Using sensors, Multiple rovers will traverse the lunar surface to discover water. The rovers will gather data to map potential spots for extraction, finding water, and approximating the amounts available. At the same time, they will collect information about the moon's environment to discover which areas offer the easiest access. The moon houses what are known as craters of eternal darkness, places light never reaches. Two rovers tethered together will work to explore the crater. One will collect sunlight from above, and the other will search for water. Once the rovers have mapped the moon's surface, iSpace will develop a rover to mine water. With rovers that drill and dig, water resources can be quarried to advance space travel. If iSpace makes a system to safely supply energy on the moon, will witness a transportation system for frequent moon visits that will contribute to our global economy. Human activity on the moon's surface offers countless possibilities with exciting results. The human race to the moon and beyond. Expand our planet. Expand our future. iSpace. Actually, this video was created by a company, startup company, iSpace. So that they are looking at, they are developing the technology for the, the commercially based the, the lunar missions. So, and uh, in the video that the idea was uh, discussed, described that uh, they are sending a multiple rovers and making the exploration uh, by the networked uh, robotic system. 
actually, this is one of the, our hot topics in the laboratory uh, at this moment. So, but now uh, I'd like to yeah, slightly expand our scope, uh, the, uh, the NASA's Mars rover mission. So um, maybe you know that the NASA uh, has been conducting, conducting the great missions uh, on the robot, uh, robotic exploration on the surface of Mars, starting with a small robot named Sojana, and then as a next step, expand, uh, the, uh, uh, upgrading to the Spirit Opportunity, and Curiosity rover, and currently Perseverance rover is, is uh, making a great exploration on the surface of Mars. So then I'm um, looking at the, this, uh, the uh, approach, uh, the starting with small robot and making the robot bigger and bigger and bigger uh, with a much more capable uh, functionality. So the today's Perseverance rover has a number of the scientific instruments and robotic manipulator arms. So that this is actually then moving uh, the research laboratory on the surface of Mars. So that the approach is one single robot and then uh, make, make everything. So, um, but uh, then maybe you know that, that today that um, uh, ingenuity, ingenuity uh, together with Perseverance rover, uh, the, um, that is, um, ingenuity is a uh, flying vehicle, uh, having a, such a rotor, uh, a drone a type of the design because the uh, Martian surface has very thin but uh, atmosphere. So but, but, uh, I'd like to tell that the uh, Tohok professors are also uh, uh, have a research topic and then certain contribution to the such type of the flying uh, robot on surface uh, of Mars. So, but um, yeah, yeah, the NASA always uh, gave me uh, gave me a great insp inspiration. So then I actually honestly uh, uh, inspired by the very first mission to the Mars uh, in 1997. The, uh, since that time, I, I also uh, doing the um, um, space robotics research and particularly the development of the sp small rovers in my research group. So uh, let me explain the one example. And uh, this uh, four-wheel rover named uh, Moon Raker and then uh, uh, we started with a, a relatively simple laboratory-based uh, test bed by using plastics and aluminiums, and then a standard the electronics and the circuits. So yeah, everything was handmade. And at that time, then uh, we bring our robot to the, some outdoor environment and co conducting some uh, testing. But uh, we are uh, designed by ourselves and the uh, manufacturer of these robots by our service uh, with, with students. So you can imagine from this picture that yeah, we are doing uh, the electronics, the mechanical, mechanics, and, and such and such. So then we bring uh, the robot to the outdoor field again. And this is one, one of the Japanese uh, sand beach, sand dune place. And um, we are uh, so excited <laughs> to do uh, such um, an, an experiment. And uh, we assume that uh, the you know, landing vehicle a future landing vehicle on, onto the surface of the moon. And then uh, our robot start the uh, exploration by touching down and then traveling up here, down here. So yeah, um, I, I hope you, you compare with uh, the NASA uh, moon buggy video. But uh, well, the scenery uh, looks uh, quite similar from my point of view. And uh, on the color, it is different, but um, yeah, we are so happy to do the, this type of the field activities time to time uh, during our development process. So there are this picture, uh, this uh, moving picture, and uh, that is a, a, one of the very challenging moment. So that is a steep slope climbing. So and uh, honestly, that this is not easy operation. So, but uh, with a very uh, nicely, specially designed wheel and control, uh, well, we can uh, achieve that. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, this video was a bit, uh, is a bit shaky. <laughs> so this is a handheld um, camera, but this uh, the slope um, angle is uh, 30 degrees, more or less. So, and quite similar situation uh, happened um, in the NASA's Mars rover mission. So and this is uh, the uh, one of the, uh, the video clip um, uh, uh, from uh, NASA's uh, Spirit rover uh, from the surface of Mars, and that this place uh, looks literally flat. 
So they covered with soft soil. Then I believe the NASA's engineer uh, first time I thought that, oh, it must be easy because uh, very flat, no rocks, no obstacles. But eventually the, such a soft soil environment was very dangerous because the wheels um, can easily sweep on the soft soil environment. So given this, uh, yeah, we can uh, test the such a soft soil environment uh, locomotion. And while we, uh, we know that if we drive on the sand beach, uh, sand dunes, or even the fresh snow and soft uh, surface, uh, soft material surface area that the wheels can easily slip. Then uh, we can uh, uh, lose the mobility in the worst case. And so the two to understand this, this stuff. So um, we should go back to the laboratory. Then uh, we do uh, some fundamental testing. This is a, a six wheel uh, robot in, in my uh, laboratory. And well, this robot uh, start uh, spinning and then uh, it's uh, completely lose the mobility. Why? And exactly the same design, the six wheel uh, independently driven. And ten, in this case, a 10 degrees a soft soil environment. But if we slightly uh, make a difference the, in the control scheme, so we can avoid uh, a critical situation. So mechanical design is one aspect, but also control. Control, uh, how to design the controllers. And that makes a difference in, in the uh, mission. So that's why that we do need uh, some um, academic knowledge to make uh, such a challenging mission uh, happen in a successful way. So then, uh, um, yeah, this is uh, one of the, our research, uh, uh, um, uh, our favorite research uh, topic. And so uh, we are doing uh, such a, a fundamental testing on a single wheel. And the today that uh, not only the experimental observation, but also that we conduct computer simulation, how the soil particles move uh, underneath the wheel. Then uh, given this, given such um, uh, knowledge, uh, we can design the uh, the uh, entire uh, robotic vehicle uh, for the successful uh, mission. So the, there are um, a lot of the theories and models and mathematics behind. So that is a very uh, exciting <laughs> for us. So, and a, yeah, then now we are ch challenging the much higher uh, traveling speed. So yeah, moon buggy, uh, that was uh, driven by human astronauts traveled 10, 20 kilometers per hour. So that uh, yeah, speed was uh, very, very high uh, from our standard uh, from the completely unmanned uh, uh, autonomous uh, robotic vehicle. So then uh, some dynamics and uh, yeah, uh, appears and in, in such a high speed mobility. So now I'd like to move on the, um, um, the different topic and that is a sensing and navigation. So again, that uh, this is a picture of the NASA's uh, successful Mars rover that has a stereoscopic camera system. And so, but uh, we want to do something different. We want something new. So then uh, we, uh, first we tried that uh, laser ranging sensor. Then uh, by the laser, we can get directly get the geometry of the environment. So then uh, this was a very exciting, the uh, interactive tail driving of the uh, remotely located vehicle. And by using this laser ranging sensor, for the direct uh, real-time acquisition of the geometry of the environment. So the, this, this type of technique is, is so uh, exciting and useful because we can get the uh, 3D, we can construct the three-dimensional map of the environment in the real time. Then uh, we can integrate all these images at the end of the exploration. Then uh, we, we build up the uh, greater map of the environment there uh, at at the end of the exploration. So, yeah, that. And also, that we are challenging the different te uh, technique. And that is a very special camera system. We got a 360 uh, panel, uh, degrees uh, panoramic uh, uh, view and by a single camera. So, you can imagine that uh, us, we see everything <laughs> and on the, uh, the field. So, then uh, if we uh, superimpose such an, the uh, a panor panorama image and laser sensing based this distance and the height measurement then of course that uh, we can get uh, we can identify the obstacles then we can the, the robot can plan the uh, detect and avoid uh, uh, avoiding maneuvers but even more we are 
today the challenging uh, much higher level. So uh, thanks to the today's uh, artificial intelligence. So deep machine learning techniques are so useful uh, not to you know, get the geometry, not to get the distance, but the, uh, today's technique tells that uh, what's the object in the scene and what's the meaning of the scene. And so, yeah, the, yes, so this is the top is the input and uh, uh, from camera, but uh, after some process, we can identify the, oh, this is a rock, this is a gravel, uh, this is a far mountain and such and such, uh, thanks to the yeah, today's AI technology. So semantic mapping is possible now. So then I would like to add one more from the, from the moon. And the, yeah, uh, the recent discovery tells such a, a very a challenging, the vertical hole, then a scientist believe that this is the entrance, natural entrance for the a horizontal tunnel um, yeah, in the uh, underground uh, uh, of the moon. So uh, the caves and tunnels were formed by a uh, volcanic activities. So that, that is a very um, um, exciting. And so the you know, caves and tunnels are, are useful for the future uh, as a natural shelter for the human outpost. And so you know, we need to go there and before that. And, but um, um, the, the weed vehicle are good for the, the surface locomotion, but for such um, the uh, cave or um, the cliff uh, climbing or down uh, uh, cliff activities, uh, the uh, walking climbing robots are necessary. So then uh, uh, today we are also working for the development of the, and testing of such a, a climbing robot and with uh, legs and gripper. And then uh, um, again, that uh, thanks to the vision and AI uh, type of the things that the, uh, we are building a map of the yeah, geometry and then uh, making the, uh, how to yes, uh, select the next step to, to grasp. So this is also uh, one of the, our ongoing research topic. So now, yes, time is, is now <laughs> getting shorter, but yeah, I'd like to uh, mention, uh, expand that our um, uh, uh, discussion to the uh, asteroid, comet, and meteorites. So um, as you may know, that Japan is uh, so successful, has been so successful, the uh, unmanned mission uh, to the, some asteroids. So the, uh, the name of the spacecraft are Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2. And I was very lucky to got um, the very precious opportunity to join this proje project uh, from the designing uh, engineering aspect. And so then uh, we started with a discussion the how to go there and how to get soil samples from the surface of the asteroid. So then we started with a kind of the uh, brainstorming things. Then uh, we yeah, narrowed down that our design. Then uh, we finally came down to this idea, the whole spacecraft make a uh, um, physical contact on the surface, then uh, making the, the touching down, then uh, um, yeah, use a fire breath with a very high velocity. So then I get the rebounding, rebounding soil particles and bring uh, put these particles uh, uh, inside the capsule and bring them back to the earth. So um, yeah, these uh, the, and the video um, and the, uh, yeah, uh, simulations were created in my laboratory. And actually, yes, this yes, uh, shows a, a, some slow motion, but actually that the speed was, it is very high. So then uh, um, having such a concept and designs, and then uh, we conduct the fundamental testing and yeah, this is the microgravity flight testing, the how the, the uh, soil particles uh, are crushed and, and then captured. Then uh, this is a one-to-one -one engineering model, that how this, uh, the structure um, um, behave on the, the moment of the touching down on the surface of the asteroid. Then uh, finally, this uh, spacecraft um, successfully arrived at our target. The, our first target was uh, named Itokawa, and then uh, that we are so surprised that, that, that this has a, such an irregular, uh, special shape, but the surface is mostly covered with uh, soil, rocks, and gravels, and those materials. Then uh, uh, we picked up that one relatively um, safe spot for the touching down sample collection. So yes, just I want to mention that the size of this asteroid is so small 
The size is just about 540 meters. And the, um, um, a, this target circle is about, uh, honestly, less than 50 meters. But this um, asteroid is located at 300 million kilometers away. So with the speed of light, that one way takes on 15 to 17 minutes. So then for the round trip on the, the, with the speed of light, with the speed of radio signals, it takes on more than half an hour. So yeah, that mission was very challenging. So in such a very difficult situation, challenging situation that I, I, I conducted uh, such a motion dynamic simulations uh, as a, one of the um, member of this uh, uh, team. And then finally, that this uh, touching down operation was so successful. And then we successfully uh, bring uh, this, uh, the capsule back to the Earth. <coughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> then, uh, yeah, the, the, the capsule was uh, retrieved um, and, yeah, in the um, uh, middle of the Australia. And then uh, uh, when we opened up the capsule, we found a number of the soil particles. So then again, that for the, this uh, the uh, yeah, reentry uh, staff and then uh, this uh, the analysis, the Tohoku professors uh, contributed uh, um, as well as me. Um, the this uh, the initial uh, analysis uh, was conducted by one of the science professor in a planetary mineralogy, orogy, uh, and he was so excited about uh, to do. Um, uh, the analysis that this even a small particle it tells um, you know, the billions of years of the history of the formation of our solar system. So then, based on this uh, great success, the uh, Japanese space uh, agency JAXA uh, achieved the secondary mission to a different uh, asteroid, and the next target uh, has a, such a shape, and then a surface is is considered. Uh, have uh, uh, the much more carbon, carbonaceous materials. So for the next, the secondary mission that more, much more careful design was, was uh, uh, conducted. Then uh, this is actually that uh, the video clip from um, JAXA for, for this time. And that tells the how to yeah, control and navigate the uh, spacecraft for the touching down and uh, lift off. So then for this time, the, um, we brought a camera system uh, attached to on the uh, spacecraft. So we got uh, such a fantastic uh, video clip. So the slowly touching down, approaching, and make um, physical contact. Then a uh, yeah, small bullet was used to crush the surface. Then uh, you see a number of the small particles are lifted off. And then uh, we successfully capture, captured some of these particles and brought back to the Earth. And, um, and simultaneously, that in, in the second mission, Hayabusa 2, uh, uh, we uh, developed a small robotic vehicle that uh, were deployed on the surface of asteroid. Then our onboard camera uh, captured such uh, fantastic uh, images on the surface of asteroid. So then, um, yeah, that this uh, Hayabusa 2 um, has already uh, returned to the Earth. Then uh, we uh, yeah, safely um, yeah, re uh, retrieve the, uh, our sample capsule, uh, which, was, which is filled with um, uh, quite a lot of um, the materials. And now that yeah, yeah, uh, scientific um, uh, investigation is going on. So um, then uh, for the, as for the asteroid, um, we, Japanese Space Agency, uh, directly challenge the, uh, this uh, sample return operation, robotic sample returns. So then uh, this was successfully achieved. Comparing to the Mars, Mars is much more challenging. The only the robotic su surface exploration has been, con has been conducted, but no material sample returns, no human expedition yet. So um, yeah, I. I'd like to now uh, conclude my talk. So um, half an hour ago, I gave you a question. Why do we go to outer space? I believe uh, you found your answers. Um, yeah, those answers may be uh, scientific curiosity or future um, you know, expedition 
uh, to the remote planet to expand our habitable zones. So we can find a number of the good reasons. So, but at the end, uh, I'd like to emphasize that space robotics is so exciting. And let's make your dreams come true with us at Tohoku University. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Yoshida, for an interesting and informative talk. Now I would like to read one question from the audience. And the question is, has your laboratory had contact with the astronauts, space agencies of Japan and overseas? Okay, yes, yeah, thank you very much for such a great question. So yeah, we have um, a, big, um, a good connection with um, space agencies, not only the JAXA Japanese Space Agency, but um, yeah, um, and during my research history, I have a, a very nice uh, connection with um, uh, NASA Canadian Space Agency, as well as European Space Agency, or even more. So, and then, uh, yeah, we, we ha I know um, many astronauts, and then what I'd like to uh, uh, yeah, add that the many of our students have a dream to become an astronaut. So there are some of them uh, they enter the uh, JAXA, and then, uh, yeah, I believe that someday that uh, my students uh, will become a real astronauts and making a great um, progress uh, to expand our uh, dreams uh, to space. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yoshida. I, I would like to inform the audience that additional questions will be answered by Dr. Yoshida during the Q&A session at the end of the event. Once again, thank you very much, Dr. Yoshida, for a great lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.